Winnie Mandela, freedom fighter and ex-wife of late former South African President Nelson Mandela. Loved by many for her struggle to free her husband and free the country. On the flip side, disputed because of complicity for murder. Now, more than two decades after her husband's release in 1990, she seems to be forgiven but not forgotten. Winnie Mandela, 1997, in front of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the TRC, in South Africa. The TRC was set up in 1996 to investigate wrongdoings during apartheid and to promote an atmosphere of reconciliation. Winnie Mandela is to be heard about her role in the violence that raged through the Soweto Township in Johannesburg in the 1980s. I am saying it is true. Things went horribly wrong. I fully agree with that. And for that part of those painful years when things went horribly wrong and we were aware of the fact that there were factors that led to that, for that I am deeply sorry. The main issue during Winnie's hearings was the murder of 14-year-old Stompy Zepe in 1988. The forced and hardly straightforward apology of the former wife of peace icon Nelson Mandela left the nation in shock. Also, it confronted people with the question of who Winnie really was and where she came from. <laughs> Winnie Mandela was born on the 26th of September 1936 in Umbongweni in the province now known as Eastern Cape. She was born in this compound that is still owned by the family. Winnie's cousin, Maheli Madikizela, says that people here are usually shy of outsiders with cameras, but he was willing to speak about his cousin. Maheli says Winnie often comes here. Yes, she visits her home. How can someone forget where she comes from? For now, she's the eldest in the family. So everything that doesn't go well, we give her a ring and arrange for her to come down. So uh, you see now, as you can see, that the fields are about to be right. She will come down for millies. We stay with her here. Maheli knows a totally different Winnie to the one who appeared before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. She's a good person, a good, caring person. Uh, someone who understands his family, someone who is helpful to the family, someone who doesn't uh, take things... I mean, if something is wrong, it won't be right. Not far away is the site of where Winnie went to school, just opposite the compound. I'm told that who and which is Winnie, started school here. If you can look at this, at these rocks here. This was a building uh, where, he sta where she started uh, sub-standard A. This is the foundation that has left after a tree fell to this building and it was never built again. It is right here that Winnie's future life was drafted through her father Columbus, who was the principal. Columbus Madikizela was also minister in the local government and had the means to send Winnie for further schooling to Johannesburg. Good education at the time was rare for blacks. These were the days of apartheid South Africa, a system of racial segregation instituted in 1948 
when Winnie was 12 years old. Black people were evicted into separate neighborhoods called townships. This is how Soweto, the southwest township in Johannesburg, came into being. In these townships, the blacks had their own services like schools and hospitals. All were inferior to the same services for whites. The blacks were only allowed out to work for their white masters in uptown areas, but were supposed to return before a blacks-only curfew. The separation was also felt in a practical sense. There were separate buses for black and white, separate entrances to public buildings, all made more obvious by the separation signboards that became the international hallmark of apartheid. Apartheid was a fact of life for young Winnie in Bongweni. The biography Winnie Mandela, A Life, tells how white magistrates humiliated both her and her father by treating them like second-class citizens. It sowed Winnie's grudge against the apartheid system from an early age. She took this grudge with her when going to study in Johannesburg. The Chris Hani Baragwanath Hospital in Soweto. Winnie was working here as South Africa's first black social worker, having finished her education. The work in the hospital brought Winnie close to the hardships of the blacks in Soweto. Then, a few months later, she met Nelson Mandela, who lived in Soweto. They married just a year later. But this wasn't romance, at least not at first. Winnie deliberately married straight into the liberation struggle, and she embraced it. She joined the 1958 banned demonstration against the ID passbooks that blacks had to carry at all times. The demonstration sent Winnie to prison for the first time. The life I've led from that moment has always been in and out of prisons. I can no longer even remember how many times I've been arrested and how many times I've been actually jailed. There have been too many. Winnie, however, kept supporting her husband and the struggle. For psychologist Sats Cooper, Winnie's commitment demonstrated her devotion to her husband and her strength. Cooper was in prison with Nelson Mandela on Robben Island for his participation in the 1976 Soweto riots. He got to know both Nelson and Winnie well. She was not a naive person who came from the rural Transkei to Johannesburg to discover uh, what the ills of apartheid were. Already there was a certain uh, steeliness, if you like. She had uh, the necessary strength to uh, commit to such a relationship. And she was uh, not as passive as one would expect in a relationship uh, where you had a strong male figure. Uh, she participated in her own right in activities, even though she was much younger than he was. Despite the danger of being involved in the liberation struggle, Winnie stayed on. She and Nelson had two girls. She raised them under continuous police harassment and arrest. But things got even worse when Nelson Mandela was sentenced to life imprisonment for terrorist acts in 1964. But still, Winnie remained defiant. She was on the steps of the Supreme Court in Pretoria when the verdict was passed. Winnie Mandela suddenly found herself on the world stage. She became the voice of the liberation struggle. Pretoria has failed to rule our country. For Sats Cooper, now head of the Psychological Society of South Africa, Winnie had the conviction and the talent to take on this role. I don't think the world would have known a Nelson Mandela were it not for Winnie. Winnie stands out in a class of her own for having the chutzpah, for having the intellect, for having the beauty, and for having 
the understanding of the moment to take advantage of. And long before sound bites became normal, she had that ability. We are here today to tell you that that day is not far when we shall lead you to freedom. Amanda! This is from me to you. Winnie even encouraged artists traveling outside South Africa to spread the message of Nelson and the struggle. Whether we're at shows, whether we're performing in stadiums or in halls, she would be there to say, you musicians, you writers, you painters, you've got the voice. More especially, you musicians or poets, talk about Mandela being released. Tell the world that we want Mandela released. And for me, I think this is the woman who kept the Mandela name alive. The anti-apartheid work meant Winnie kept being arrested, but somehow she got used to it. But there was one arrest she would never forget. The one she described in her memoirs, 491 Days, about her jailing in 1969 for having committed propaganda for the banned ANC. She was shouted at, beaten, threatened with rape and murder, kept awake and interrogated continuously. Life, a human being, was so sacrosanct that I could never on my own lift up a finger against any human being for ideological reasons. But what I went through that personal experience hardened me so much that at the end of my interrogation, looking at my interrogators and what I had gone through, I knew that as I sat in that cell, in that cell, if my own father or my brother walked in dangling a gun and he was on the other side and I had the gun too in my hand, in defense of the ideals for which I was being tortured, then I would fire. Winnie's struggle from then on would take a completely different direction. Being subjected to the kind of treatment, torture and humiliation that she was, she must have become very angry and wanted to seek uh, a kind of vengeance for that. And so the kinds of things that she embarked on thereafter were exemplary of that. You know, she became more outspoken uh, and in some instances uh, fairly uh, in your face with the authorities. She defied them openly. She made challenging and provocative statements. Winnie took her anger back with her to Soweto. She got involved in the 1976 Soweto uprising, a riot immortalized in street art along the Villa Kazi street where the unrest broke out. The uprising was started by school children like this, demonstrating against making the white man's language Afrikaans compulsory in black secondary schools. They were running battles for days. Demonstrators, of which many were children, were killed by the police. The uprising was symbolized worldwide by this picture of a dead student, Hector Peterson, being carried by his crying friend. Winnie's alleged participation in the Soweto uprising preluded the next stage in her life. Conscious of her growing influence, the apartheid government banished Winnie to the remote town of Brantford in the then Orange Free State. Brantford was founded by the descendants of the original Dutch settlers that came to South Africa to start a new life. If there ever was a true 
white South Africa, it was here. Winnie Mandela was dumped in the area designated for blacks. She was brought to this makeshift house by the police that is still inhabited. The police didn't tell local residents who she was, only that they were not allowed to speak to her. Winnie is not forgotten here, and certainly not by her former neighbor, 73-year-old Nora Nomafa, who remembers well how Winnie lived. This is the kitchen. And here, there were, there, were, there were couples who were standing, which were standing here now for packing the dishes and what have you. And here was the washing uh, basin. This was the sink whereby she used to wash the dishes. And at this corner, there was a stove here, uh, a coal stove, as you can see the chimney up here. Despite the fact that Nora was not supposed to talk to Winnie, they managed to become friends. Nora was helping Winnie when she was sick. I managed to help her. We took her to the doctor in Bloemfontein. Then from there, we were friends. Then Winnie wrote me a letter saying, now you are my best friend. I've never ever had anyone to help me. As a good neighbor, Winnie started to help the people around Brantford. Nora remembers how Winnie used to cook for her, but also was scared of the police for taking the food. She would make fire and cook mealy stamp. It takes time, Musa, right? And then she would say, please don't cook over there. I'm having the meal, the, 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 the stamp over here. You must come and eat, knowing very well that I am afraid of coming in, I won't come in. Instead, I might even just stand next to the fence there, uh, sending my dish, saying that, could you kindly please do me a favor by doing this? Yes, enough. But we're just friends. Uh, and the best friend, in fact, was Winnie. After this, Winnie picked up her social work and asked Nora to assist in opening a medical clinic next to her home that over the years went up in ruins. Then Winnie organized a soup kitchen in this building and she opened the first crash in Brantford that still exists. This was another face of the militant and angry Winnie. This was the compassionate Winnie. All her efforts made Winnie very popular. Even the people of Brantford, they used to say, you are a godmother. Oh, we didn't want to hear a thing about Winnie. If you are saying Winnie, yo, you must know that you are touching us because uh, she was of a great help. She did her work with tremendously in Brantford. Even today, if you are saying Winnie, the people of Brantford will say, Mama, Mama, because of her efforts in Brantford. The clinic was eventually destroyed by the ever harassing police. They did it during one of Winnie's rare visits to Nelson Mandela on Robben Island. It made Winnie angry and defy her banishment and return to Soweto. Winnie's Brantford home is now set to become a museum. Going from Brantford to Soweto for Winnie was like jumping from the frying pan into the fire. Soweto in the late 1980s was the scene of running battles between police and groups opposing apartheid. Winnie's militancy resurfaced. In a 1986 speech in Munsville, she called for violence. I am back with you where I belong. This is now the right time to take your country. We shall use the same language the Boers are using against us. They know only one language, the language of the Kaspers. We have no, no arms, we have stones, we have boxes of matches. With our necklaces, we shall liberate this country. <laughs> Necklacing is a South African technique of torturing and killing a person by putting a rubber tire around their neck and setting it on fire with petrol. The ANC, who were then mainly operating in exile, distanced themselves from Winnie's calls for violence. 
Sats Cooper says this made Winnie go for it alone. Faced with the hatred of the apartheid state and its agents, faced with the lack of support from her own comrades, things would have happened in her mind to make her believe in her own power and ability, which would have created the room for behavior that may be regrettable later. Winnie's call for action didn't go unheard in Soweto, where there was already a culture of violence. South Africa is a very violent society. It's not become violent because of Winnie Mandela. It's been violent through colonial conquest at its sequela and through apartheid. People in Soweto today acknowledge that they didn't shy away from violence during the apartheid struggle. Mandela family friend Joyce Makubu is typical of many in Soweto. I'm telling you, as a very young, as a young, very young girl, I nearly became a murderer at a very tender age because I felt like this was too much. We have to live here, we have to survive here. We have to be able to go to the shops without fear. We have to be able to go to school without fear. Then I decided if it means I should kill somebody or go to jail, but I'm going to make a mark that we also have a right to stay here and be free and play with other kids if we want to. The police harassment in Soweto in the late 1980s made several youths join Winnie Mandela for shelter. These boys became the Mandela United Football Club. She had around her a lot of people. And that, you must understand, was something that I think she cherished because when she was banished to Brantford, she was isolated and there were periods when she was very much alone. And so to come back into Soweto and have people around her that were vibrant uh, would have been something she thrived on. But these same boys were the harbinger of many things going horribly wrong for Winnie. The Mandela United Football Club degenerated into a violent gang terrorizing Soweto. Then the Mandela United Football Club slowly got infiltrated by secret police informers seeking intelligence on the ANC. The notion in Soweto about these informers created paranoia and anybody found to be one was killed, often by necklacing. It even led to the occurrence of cartoons like this. Winnie's Mandela United Football Club was eventually infiltrated by several informers, although they did not know each other. Then in 1988, 14-year-old Stompy Zepai was killed in Winnie Mandela's house on suspicion of being a police informer. According to Sats Cooper, it is unclear whether Winnie gave a direct order, but because of the paranoia caused by the informers, the slightest suspicion of being an informer uttered by Winnie would have been enough to be killed. They would be uh, second-guessing her thoughts if she uh, expressed a single uh, word against somebody or uh, gave a look that was disdainful. That would have been sufficient cause for them to act on it, to say, well, Mama feels like this, therefore we must do it. Yvonne Chakachaka Chaka insists Winnie would never condone acts like that. She opened her house to young children, everybody. And unfortunately, some bad things happened there. I don't think it was of her making. She didn't condone that. She didn't allow those things to happen, but they happened. You know, when you, when you house lots of people, when you give people a roof over their head, you don't have lots of control of what they're going to be doing. So really, I don't want to, to, to paint her black because she was trying to do good. Killing an informer was business as usual in Soweto. A child though, that was deplorable. But in the madness of those days, the distinction between adult and child 
ceased to exist. During apartheid, the roles were terribly bizarre. You know, they weren't the kind of uh, controls that normal societies would have, where the parent is in charge. Here you have uh, a stompy sipe who, at 11, 12, was a leader in his community. Whereas you would expect that his parent, his teacher would be. But the roles are reversed. So it's that abnormality that uh, allows for the kind of uh, murder, if you like, of somebody like this. It left the people of Soweto in shock. Winnie's former neighbors remember all too well the insanity of the time. I sympathized a lot because I, I, I had seen firsthand what she did for us and in the community. Now, to me, that was a black mark. That incident was a black mark. And uh, I would say to, to, to an extent, I was hoping against hope that the accusations are false, are wrong, you see. But then, as everybody knows, she went to court and she was found guilty for this and that and couldn't be too good for her image. Did it make you sad? To a point, yes. I'm sure it made everybody sad. Mm, I think in the 1980s, I was no... I just hear all those stories. After 1990s, which she have done so and so. But in fact, from bad to good, I think she must be forgiven. Why? Because she, at last, she have done good things to help people not to die. The ANC again distanced itself from Winnie Mandela, and from his cell, Nelson ordered her to disband the football club. She did. An investigation was started against Winnie Mandela on charges of complicity in murder. But the charges were overshadowed by the release of Nelson Mandela in 1990. This was the moment that Winnie Mandela had been struggling for during the last 27 years. But the happiness was short-lived, since only two years later, Winnie would find herself separated from Nelson Mandela. Africa.